والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Inspirations This is your show in which we discuss and we talk about the life of the greatest man who lived ever on this earth Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We are trying to get ourselves personally involved in his life in everything so we can see so much of the light of his guidance and we will try to get as much as possible and implement in our lives so that we will be the best Muslims that we can be, insha'Allah. You are all invited to, co- uh, to uh, write to us on our email address, inspirations at huda.tv. Again, it's inspirations at huda.tv. I thank you so much for your emails. As I said, they're very important to us. And insha'Allah, when we have the live episode, the first Saturday of every month, most of the time, insha'Allah, you can join us and you can call in. And as I said, the last time that the live episode insha'Allah will be dedicated for the viewers. So you can call in and we will try to read some of your emails. So please do write to us and do call in. As I said, your contributions are very important in this show and they add a lot to it. So may Allah reward you for that. Last time we were talking about the response of the Jews to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did they receive him? We mentioned some examples of people who believed in his message because they recognized that he was the Prophet and the final messenger referred to in their scriptures. Some of them out of hatred, out of envy, out of jealousy and out of bigotry they decided to disbelieve in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and dedicate their lives to fight him and destroy his message. Now let's leave the Jews and leave their plots and their schemes, and let's move to talk a shining example. We said previously that the Prophet ﷺ first came to the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, the very famous companion. Abu, Yu- Abu Ayyub al-Ansari received the Prophet ﷺ in his house. His house was two levels, two stories. So the Prophet ﷺ said, we will stay in the ground level, and you can stay in the first level, on top. Because it's easy for us, people come to visit me, so they can easily come into my house instead of you know, mounting the stairs and coming to, then come into my house. So they can st- we can stay in the ground level, this is the best thing for us, it's easy for people, it's easier for us. Yeah Abu Ayyub. But Abu Ayyub felt a bit embarrassed. He said, O Messenger of Allah, how can I live... You know, on, on, on top of, of your house, on top of you. I can't imagine myself living on a level above your level. I can't do that. The Prophet ﷺ said, Yeah, Abu Ayyub, it's easier for us. It's better for us and it's better for the people. So under that insistence of the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Ayyub said, Okay. So he and his wife were on the first level or on the second floor, on the top of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ remained in the ground level. Now Abu Ayyub couldn't stay in his house. He said, I couldn't even consider or th- even think about myself walking above the head of the Messenger ﷺ. So he limited himself and his wife to one side of the house, just near the walls. Just near the walls, this is the only allowed space or area for them. Because he said, I might be anywhere around my house, and the Prophet ﷺ would be below my, below my feet. He said, I couldn't see myself doing that. So he didn't feel comfortable in his own house. He said, I had to just limit myself to near the walls, so I won't be stepping on any area where the Prophet ﷺ would be under me, or underneath. And he would prepare food for the Prophet ﷺ and give it to him. Every time he would give the Prophet ﷺ the plate of food, the Messenger ﷺ would eat from it, and then he would give it back to Abu Ayyub. Abu Ayyub and his wife would search for the, any spots on the plate where the Prophet ﷺ ate, and they would eat from the same spot, seeking blessings from the Prophet ﷺ. And this is an act which is legitimate in Islam. Those who lived at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they can seek blessings from everything the Prophet ﷺ touched or any part or, uh, or any uh, part of the body of the Prophet ﷺ, or any part of his clothes, the personal 
belongings of the Prophet ﷺ, people were allowed to seek blessings by means of that. But we see today some people seeking blessings by going to the graves of dead people. This is totally not allowed. Some people consider you know, uh, their shaykhs to be so blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they can you know, seek blessings from them by touching them, by taking some of their sweat, taking some parts of their clothes. That's totally an act of shirk. And it leads to disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is something special to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, excuse me, <coughs> would... Uh, and his wife would follow or try to see any of the traces of where the, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ate from the plate, and they would eat from that very spot. But one day, they sent a plate to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after they cooked a food, and they put in it garlic or onions. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not eat from it, but he gave it back to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. Abu Ayyub felt very troubled when he saw that the plate came back as it was. It means the Prophet ﷺ did not, mean, did not eat from it. So he was very troubled. He thought he made some mistake that the Prophet ﷺ did not want to eat from his food. So he rushed to the Messenger ﷺ and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, you didn't eat from, from the food. The Prophet ﷺ said, Take it easy, Ya Abu Ayyub. There is garlic or onions in this food. I, I don't eat from it because I... I'm in a constant state of supplication to Allah. All the time I'm remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the, whenever every time a person remembers Allah, or is making supplication to Allah, there are the angels around him. And the angels feel hurt by the same things that hurt a human being. This smell of onions is a bit off-putting. So the Prophet ﷺ says, I'm in a constant state of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioning his name. So I can't, eat from that tree, but you can eat from it, from the onions or garlic. So they ate it, then Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said to the Messenger وسلم, and this shows us how much love they had for the Prophet وسلم, and it shows us that when you love someone, you are keen to follow his example. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, O oh Messenger of Allah, since you don't like garlic and onions, I don't like it too. I will, I will do away with it, I don't want it. So even taste, in terms of taste, they are following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it shows us today that many, many times we hear from people, who, when you show them the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they say, you know, but this, this is something I don't like personally. As a personal taste, I don't like it. There is something we have to set right now here. Your taste, your personal taste is not something inherited like that. It's all based on your experience in this life. It's based on your personal preference. It's based on your surroundings, the environment, your background. So when someone says, I don't like this type of clothes, it doesn't mean you are born to hate this type of clothing. It doesn't mean that. But it means you've been brought up and your personal experience has come up to the to give the result that you don't like that. Many people when they are advised to wear, for example, or to commit themselves to the uh, guidance of the Prophet ﷺ in terms of dress code, the dress code, especially men or women, they say, but I don't like this. I don't like, for example, the qameez, the thawb. I don't like it, you know. I don't, uh, a woman, for example, says, I don't like the full hijab, you know. I, as, as a person, I don't like it. That's my personal taste. We deal with a personal taste as if it is something taken for granted. Your personal taste is the result of different factors, different things. Now when we develop our faith, when our faith grows, and we become more attached to the Prophet wasallam, our personal taste will change to like the things that he likes. When we are impressed with a certain culture or a certain civilization, people are impressed, for example, with the Western civilization, so they tend, their taste changes and grows, and is more inclined to love the taste of that own civilization. So when people become more attached to the Western civilization, their taste, their personal taste, becomes more like the taste of the people who are part of this civilization. 
So when Iman grows in the heart, and we become personally more attached to the Prophet ﷺ, we become more attached to the Qur'an, to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to the example of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, then our personal taste will change to match their own taste. This is something we have to understand. And even sometimes the things you like and the things you don't like, when you become a practicing Muslim, when you become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your taste will change. So you will start to love some, some things you hated before. And you will start to hate some things which you loved before. Many times when we were talking to non-Muslims, for example in the UK, when we were talking to them about the lifestyle, like the dating and the nightclubs and the nightlife and the way they waste their lives. When, you, when we used to discuss that with them, for example, talking about nightclubs and nightlife and having relations outside the wedlock, all, the only response they had, they say, we like it. We like it. That's me. You know, that's me. I like that. I can't live without it. This is the only response they had. And then we had to clarify to them, your personal taste, your personal uh, you know, inclinations, your personal tendencies are not something you are born with. It's not something inherited you, that you can't change. No. You make your personal taste. The surroundings, the background makes your personal taste. So be careful. There's nothing taken for granted as I love this, I don't love, I don't love that. And this is how things are. No. You have to work around that. And loving something or loving someone, it's not a matter of, uh, as I said, of a magical uh, uh, formula that makes you love this person or not love that person. Or it's not in your genes to love this person or love that person. No. It is something you have to work for. Many people have problems, like for example with their wives, or a wife with her husband. She says, I just don't like him, that's it. No, there are things that led to the fact that you like him or you don't like him. And many times when we were dealing with some cases of, uh, you know, counseling, family counseling, many sisters, for example, they have a problem, a sister has a problem with her husband. She says, well, we used to love each other, but now I don't love him anymore. I just can't live with him. And when we search for the reasons, you know what the reasons were? The reasons were that some sisters don't lower their gaze, and they look at other men, and they become more attached to those men, so they stop loving their husband, and they can't live with him anymore. This is what the case is. And many brothers have the same problem. They don't control their eyes, so they look at women in the street, women who are not dressed properly, or on TV. And they give their eyes a free play, a free range. So they look at women, and they think that they are enjoying themselves, and what happens? Their wives don't appeal to them anymore. So they start to develop this kind of feeling that I don't love her. I, don't lo I just don't love her. This is, that's me. That's me. I don't love her. Something happened. I don't love her. No, you led yourself to that stage. You led yourself to that stage. And we know in Islam that you more, the more you, l you learn about your Creator, the more you learn about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you love Him. So love is something that you make and you create. Yes, there is some kind of element of, an, of your own nature, that you like something or you dislike something. But this is limited to certain things, and it has a very limited percentage of influence on your personal taste. So your personal taste, you make it yourself. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari gives us a clear example. He says, O Messenger of Allah, as long as you don't love onions, you don't like onions and garlic, I don't like it too. That's it. Personal taste. So personally, or straight away, his personal taste has changed. Why? Because love of the Prophet ﷺ was so deep in his heart that it changes his character straight away. And this is the kind of love that we need today. Many times we see Muslims, you know, when you give them advice, they're not happy with some of the teachings of Islam. They say, that's me. No, it's not you. It's shaitan who has led you to that. So you have to check yourself very carefully. And you have to free yourself 
from personal uh, inclinations, from personal taste, and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be ready to take the truth and accept it. Once you do that, you will see that your personal taste will change. Now this is the problem with many people today. And we hear that, especially the practicing brothers and sisters. And I heard that personally many times. They say, you know, when you grow your beard, and when you stick to the, uh, dress, code of the, uh, the dress code of the sunnah, okay, this will turn people away from you, because people don't like that. People by nature don't like that. Who told you that? No, because people have, have you know, made themselves so submissive to the Western culture, to the, to the culture of the non-Muslims, they have become controlled by it. So they have turned away from the, the guidance of the Prophet ﷺ, so they don't, lo- they don't like it anymore. That's it. Anything that has to do with it, they don't like it. Anything that is not in line with the Western culture, they don't like it. Simple. So we have to work on our personal taste because it's a result of our own choices that we made ourselves. I know many brothers who didn't like to wear thawbs, who didn't like to grow their beards. But as, lo- as soon as they started to appreciate the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and learn about Muhammad وسلم, and love him more, as soon as they said, this is, the, this is the kind of dress code that I really prefer as a person. A few years ago, they hated it, they didn't like it. They said, it doesn't matter what personal taste. But now, they like it. Why? So your personal taste is a, as I said, a culmination of your experience, your background, and of decisions you made yourself. So be careful what kind of decisions you make. So as I said, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari gave us a very wonderful example of how taste is a follower of your aqidah. Taste is a follower of your decisions. Taste is a follower of your way of life. So there is nothing absolute about this thing is nice, this thing is ugly. This thing is, you know, appeals to me, this thing doesn't appeal to me. There's nothing absolute about it. We keep changing according to our own convictions, according to our own understandings, according to the way we look at things. So let's be careful about this. And let's keep this in mind because it has a major role to play today in our lives. Now, inshallah, we will see more about the beautiful things and, and the beautiful example of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, how he dealt with the Prophet wasallam, how sensitive a person becomes when his iman grows, and how uh, wonderful his feelings become, how high and uh, esteem uh, his uh, feelings and his personal or his human feelings towards other, how, they, how high and sensitive they become, inshallah we will find out after, th- after this short break, so stay tuned. Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. Just before the break, we were talking about the great example of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Now, one day, Abu Ayyub al Ansari, he had a jar of water. And uh, one day they dropped it and it broke, and the water was spilt. On the floor, and as he was on top of the house or the level of the Prophet, and we know that the ceiling at that time wasn't made of concrete or anything, was made of the palm trees, uh, the leaves of the palm trees, that was everything. So he expected the water to leak down on the Prophet. 
So straight away he brought the only blanket they had in the house and they tried he, him and his wife to dry the water so they won't hurt the Prophet ﷺ, even if it be with a drop of water. Then after all this agony, imagine how sensitive he was. He wouldn't walk around his house as I said because he didn't want to be above the Prophet ﷺ. And he didn't want the water to leak on the Prophet ﷺ. So he went to the Messenger ﷺ and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, please, please, I beg you, go on the higher level and let me be on the ground floor because I can't live anymore on the level which is above your level in the house, even if it be like that, like that physically. I can't do it. Please go upstairs. Go to the first floor. Upon that insistence, the Prophet ﷺ accepted and Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was at rest then. Then he could walk freely in his house and he, can, he could do whatever he wanted to do. So this is a shining examples, example that shows us how much love the companions had to the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because he saved them. Or Allah saved them by him from the darkness into the light. They were wonderful people. There were sensitive individuals who realized how great the man among them was. They gave him his true worth. They realized that he was such a special man and he deserved all, he, he, he deserved all honor, all dignity and all care. And they were really up to the level of that. May Allah be pleased with them. The Prophet, this is why the Messenger ﷺ praised the Ansar so much with such beautiful words one day he says that the sign of iman is to love the ansar imagine the sign of a person having iman and faith is that he loves the ansar and the sign of hypocrisy is that person hates the ansar this is the how important the ansar are in al-islam and the prophet sallallahu says said many times actually he said that no one loves the ansar except a believer only a believer loves the Ansar. And only a hypocrite hates the Ansar. So a sign, why? Because they helped Islam. They opened their arms and they opened their lands and their houses to Islam and they received it. They put their lives at stake for the sake of receiving Islam and defending the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. So they deserve a high position in the religion of Islam. So what do you think about people today who still live until today? And they consider most of the companions to have apostated. And they say that they are kuffar. And they say that they are in, in the hellfire. And those people claim to be Muslims today. And they claim to be defending Islam. Now maybe they are defending their own interest. Maybe they are defending their, their own selves and their own people. And maybe they are fighting the enemies of Islam. This, is, this might be true, but still there are doubts about it. But even if they are doing that, don't forget they're not doing it for the sake of Islam, which Muhammad ﷺ came with. They came, or they are doing that for defending their own way of life, which, which they claim to be Islam. And if they get power, and if they take over, you will see how these people will kill the people of Ahl Sunnah everywhere. Because their history testifies to that. Throughout their history, they always helped the enemies of the Muslims. They were always on the side against them, on the side which was against the Muslims. For example, they helped the Tatars, the, Mo the Mughals, when they invaded Baghdad and when they invaded Damascus, Damascus. They helped them, they supported them. They always, you know, had uh, alliance with the crusaders against the Muslims throughout their history. And they killed so many Muslims, millions of Muslims throughout the history. And even when the Uthmani Empire was at its early stages defending Islam, spreading Islam in Europe... You remember Muhammad al-Fatih, the one who opened Constantinople, which is Istanbul today? His son, the Khalifa who came after him, when he, he wanted to spread Islam in Europe, when Islam reached Bosnia, and uh, when Islam reached Yugoslavia, when Islam reached Romania, and they were actually on the borders of Vienna. 
in Switzerland, in, in, sorry, uh, in Austria. And they reached those lands, uh, Switzerland, Germany, they reached those lands and Islam spread and the people accepted Islam. Do you know what stopped them? Those people were backbiting them, were stabbing them in the, in the back. And they were in what is called today as uh, Iran. And they were stabbing the Islamic empire there in the back when they were trying to spread Islam in Europe. Those people, those enemies of Islam, were trying to destroy this Islamic empire from the back and from inside. And they caused, caused many rebellions and many riots to occur within the uh, Islamic empire at that time. So don't think that today, after about 1,400 years of enmity towards Islam, of plotting and scheming against Islam and Muslims, and of destroying and killing Muslims, that today they're going to change that. No. Their beliefs are still the same. Their goals are still the same. Their alliance and their tendencies are still the same. So what makes them today the heroes of Islam? Only delusions. So let's be aware of that. So the Ansar are the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They held Islam. They sacrificed their lives. They sacrificed their own city. They sacrificed their belongings for the sake of championing Islam, for the sake of spreading Islam, for the sake of protecting Islam. And inshallah we will come to see in the coming episodes how wonderful those people were. How great they were when we see their sacrifice, when, this, when we see their generosity. When we see all of this, inshallah, we will see why the Prophet ﷺ and why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them such a high station in Islam. That only a believer loves them and only a hypocrite hates them. This is something we have to be aware of. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was an example. Now one day when the Prophet ﷺ was with his companions, someone with a shabby face, a slave, came, he was dusty, and the signs of sl uh, slavery were clear on him. He was abused. His master really did a very good jo job in wearing him out. He came. And he approached the Prophet ﷺ and his companions. That person came or had come to the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Quba. If you still remember, he came with some food and he said, This is a charity. This is some food I kept for charity and I heard that you need it. He said to the Prophet ﷺ, I heard that you and companions, you need that. So he gave it to the Messenger ﷺ. The Messenger ﷺ made his companions eat from it, but he didn't touch it. But this time, the same slave with his shabby face, came to the Messenger وسلم, and introduced some food. And he said, Well, I brought this as a gift to you and your companions. So the Prophet وسلم, took the food and he ate from it and he gave it to his companions. So this slave, this man, when he saw that, he said, This is number two. If you remember, when we talked about the first time when he brought the charity, he said, This is number one. And now he's saying this is number two. Let's leave this slave or this man because we will come back to him inshallah very soon to find out about his story because he has a wonderful story. Now the Prophet wasallam here in Medina living with his companions and he would pray wherever the time of prayer came. Whenever the time of prayer fall, uh, you know, fell he would pray there. They didn't have a masjid at that time. But the Prophet ﷺ realized that as the, the society, the, the Islamic society there in Medina was growing, people were coming from outside Medina. Because people started hearing about Islam. Some of the early Muslims who came to the Prophet ﷺ in Medina or in Mecca, when he was weak, you remember, because we, we mentioned some of them, some of their stories, when they came to the Prophet ﷺ, the Messenger ﷺ said to them, Go back to your homeland, go back to your tribe. When you hear that we have appeared and we have become a power, then you come, can come and join us. So many of those people started to come to Medina and join the society, the Muslim society in Al Medina. So the Muslim society was growing. The Messenger ﷺ realized that we have to establish a masjid here, where it has 
it will become the center of the community for social life, political life, religious life, education, everything. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to build the masjid. He found very close to the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari an, uh, an empty piece of land. What was there actually some rubbish would be put, it's like, it was like uh, a, sc- a scrapeyard. So the Prophet ﷺ asked Bani Najjar to sell him that land. They said, no, we will give it for free. The Prophet ﷺ said, no, we will pay for it. It was for two orphan boys. So the Messenger ﷺ paid for it and they started building the masjid. There were some palm trees there, they were cut and they started building the masjid. Everybody took part in the act of building the masjid. Even the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa would hold the bricks on his shoulders, and he would help carry them from one place to the other, and would help in building the walls of the masjid. There was a person coming from Yamama. Yamama is in the uh, eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula. The eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula. Peninsula, which is very near to the Arab Gulf today, which is known as the Persian Gulf, but it is in fact the Arab Gulf. So, this man had already believed in the Prophet ﷺ, so he came to join the Islamic society in Medina. He was a very skillful builder. He had a lot of experience in terms of building, in terms of how to make the bricks and how to put, how to make walls. He was ver, uh, very skillful in that. So the messenger, his name was Talq ibn Ali. Talq ibn Ali al-Yamami. He, is, he has a very beautiful story. Now, as he was very skillful, the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, you know, give the mud or let the mud for the uh, guy from Yamama because he is a very skillful Builder, he's the best one to make bricks and he's the best one to make the walls. So there is a lesson that we can take from this. We will try to uh, see what it is and see what's the story of this man after we take a short break. So stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. And if you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are the seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to notes only in the 20th century the true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth it is just Allah's way to make our spirits Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. And we are still talking about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to build the masjid. And as we said, he bought the land that belonged to two children, two orphans, um, from among the uh, Banu Najjar, the tribe of Banu Najjar. The Muslims started to build. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took part in that. And he would carry the bricks with the others. Now, one of the companions had a very high zeal. Everybody would carry one brick at a time, but Mus'ab ibn Umayr would carry two bricks at a time. And we know that Mus'ab ibn Umayr, when he was in Mecca, he was a very spoiled child and young man. But when he came to Islam, he had so many uh, difficulties putting up with the new challenges, but he set a wonderful example for everybody to follow. And he uh, had... Oh, he actually, he made so many sacrifices for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we said the best among the Muslims in terms of building, the most skillful was Talq ibn Ali al-Yamami coming from Yamama, which was in the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula. He was a very skillful man. This is why the Prophet ﷺ would say, okay, leave this work for him. How to make the 
bricks and how to make the mud and all of that, the Prophet ﷺ said, he is the best among you in that, so let this part of the job for him. Now this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ appreciated uh, specialty and appreciated specialization. When somebody specializes in some area and he's very skillful in it, so leave the job that is related to his specialty for that person. This is a very important rule in administration and in management. That when somebody is skillful at something, okay, let him do it. Put everyone in the right place. It's not a matter of favor, favoritism. If I know this person, I put him in this position. If I don't know that person, even if he's qualified for it, okay, just leave him, we put someone that we know. We say, the one that we know is better than the one we don't know. No. This is not how the Prophet ﷺ conducted his affairs. But he saw that man was qualified for that job, so he said, okay, let, let, let this person do it. And this shows us that if we want to succeed, we have to appreciate skill, and qualifications. Without that, we will be wasting our time. So the Prophet ﷺ uh, praised, he praised this man, Talq ibn Ali al-Imami. Uh, he, he praised him so much for his skill, and the Messenger ﷺ himself would carry, as I said, the bricks on his own shoulder and help the Muslims. He didn't sit back watching the people building the masjid, and he would enjoy, you know, the, uh, enjoy the privilege of being the leader. No, he was one of them. He helped them, he worked as they did. And when he saw Mus'ab ibn Umayr carrying two bricks on his shoulders, he would come and uh, rub uh, his, the shoulders of Mus'ab ibn Umayr uh, and wipe away the, the dust from his shoulder. So he would actually sometimes as well say some lines of poetry. He would say, Allahumma la aisha illa aishu al-akhirah. Uh, oh Allah, the only real life is the life of the Akhirah, the life of the last day in paradise. So oh Allah, give victory to al muhajirin wal Ansar. Allahumma la aisha illa aishu al Akhirah, Fansur al Ansara wal Muhajira. So the Prophet ﷺ would encourage his companions, let's do more work, let's do more work. And they would repeat after the Prophet ﷺ, such a beautiful spirit. Really, one would wish to be among them. Seeing, imagine the Prophet ﷺ being with the companions, and they would be very active with a high spirit. Everyone, somebody making the bricks, somebody making the mud, and they would start to cut the bricks, and they would carry the bricks and make walls, and everybody's encouraging each other. Such a wonderful, you know, teamwork, such a wonderful spirit that they had. One would really wish to be among them. And see the Prophet ﷺ behaving like any one of them, like an average person. Encouraging them, carrying the bricks with them, building with them, helping them, cutting some of the palm tree trunks with them. Such a beautiful spirit. Where do we find a leader like that? Where do we find a leader like the Prophet ﷺ? So this is a wonderful tip for any leader or any administrator or manager. Any person in charge, make the people feel that you feel for them, that you feel their suffering. Don't put barriers between you and them. Don't try or don't look down upon them. Don't see yourself to be high above them. You are all, this, you are all human beings. When they feel that you are with them and you feel for them, there will be a totally new spirit. The teamwork will be there. This is how the Prophet ﷺ was, helping the companions, carrying the bricks with them, building with them, you know, preparing the mud with them. Such a wonderful, such a beautiful spirit. So quickly and in a very short time, they managed to build the masjid. Now, uh, at that time, the Qibla, the direction of the prayer was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. It wasn't the Kaaba. It was Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. So the Qibla was to the north of al Medina. In the direction of the Qibla, they put the tree trunks, they arranged them in a way to make the wall, to mark al Qibla. So they arranged them on top of each other, so they, could, they were the wall facing al Qibla. So whenever they prayed, they faced the, the trunks, the palm tree trunks. They, this wall marked the Qibla. And uh, then they made, they made the, uh, the ceiling, they made it with the palm tree leaves. 
and branches. This is how they made it. So every time it rained, the water would actually uh, would leak into the masjid and they would be praying in the rain or under the rain. So this was generally the description of how they built the masjid and the masjid was a very important institution or part of the society. Now today, unfortunately, the, Muslim, uh, the masjid is not playing the role it is supposed to play in the Islamic, on the Muslim society. Because in the Muslim society, the masjid is the place for worship, the five daily prayers. Now surprisingly, all the Muslims would go and pray in the masjid, almost all of them, except for the ones who had excuses. Like sometimes Abdullah uh, ibn, Umi, ibn Umi Maktoum, and another person called Itban, uh, and other uh, Muslims who are known in the books of Hadith, their cases are known, where the Prophet ﷺ gave to some of them excuses. So the masjid, all the Muslims five times a day would gather in the masjid to pray with the Prophet ﷺ. So it was a place for worship, it was a place for the social life, everybody would meet there, and it was a place for running the political affairs as will become evident for us in the future inshallah. So the masjid played a very central role in the Muslim society and this is how it should be. Especially with education. Now, it was the school, the masjid was the school, it was the university. Until a very later stage in the Islamic history, the masjid was, played the role of the school and the university. And unfortunately today, we, we, we hardly have similar cases. So we hope that one day, inshallah, the masjids will come back to assume their role, their wonderful role in the Islamic, in the Muslim society, to be a place for worship, a place for remembering Allah subhanahu wa taala, a place for education, a place for running the political affairs of the Islamic ummah, and a place for the social life, and to to assume back the central position in the Muslim uh, society. Now, this Talq ibn Ali. The person from Yamama, the very skillful person in terms of building and making the bricks. He had a, very, a beautiful story, interesting story. He says that we came from Yamama, we believed in the Prophet ﷺ, but when we were on our way back to Yamama, go back to our homeland, to our people, we said to the Messenger of Allah, we have a church. There was a Christian priest who came and he preached Christianity. Some of them accepted Christianity. So he said, uh, we, had, uh, we have a church, O Messenger of Allah, in our land. And we want to get rid of that because our people are accepting Islam. The Messenger ﷺ said to him, Okay, I will make wudu and I will give you the remains or the water from my wudu. You take it, you demolish that church there, you get rid of it. And you pour the water in that area, which is the remains of my wudu. And then you build the masjid there. So inshallah it will be purified and you can build the masjid there. So they, the Prophet ﷺ put it in a container, that water. But they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you know, it's, it's very hot, it's the desert. So as, by the time we reach our land, it would have dried. So he said to them, add more water. Every time it's about to dry, add more water to it. There's no problem with that. So there were a group of people, a bunch of people. So they said, we were fighting and competing, who's going to hold this container? So we agreed to take roles, to take turns. So everyone held it for one day, and then until we reached our homeland, we demolished the church, and we poured water there, and we built a masjid, and the priest ran away, and he left. He said, when he heard us calling to the prayer, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah, he said, they said, he ran away and he left. He said, this is a call of truth. And it seems that he was on the false religion, or the, on a false version of Christianity. Obviously, this story was at a later stage. But as it is related to Talq ibn Ali, we decided to mention it uh, today. Now the Prophet ﷺ started to give khutbah in the masjid every Jum'ah. And there is a beautiful story related to giving the khutbah, but we will leave it inshallah for future episodes. Now, uh, next time inshallah, next week, we will have a live episode. So you are invited to join us. The numbers will appear on the screen inshallah. So don't forget to call in. The episode will be dedicated to your emails, your phone calls, and to taking lessons from the events of the seerah. So that 
as I said, this, this live episode will be dedicated only for you, so you can uh, have something, to have your say, have something to say about it, and share with us. So the lines will be open right from the first moment, the first minute of the show, and you are invited to call in, have something to say, anything related to the show, anything related to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, please do call in, join us. If you don't want to call in, you can still write to us and we will read some of the emails. And don't forget, I will be waiting for your emails about the three questions that Abdullah ibn Salam, or the answers to the three questions Abdullah ibn Salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, inshallah, next time as I said, we will discuss more about the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But without mentioning events, we will try to draw lessons and we will, we, we will be waiting for your phone calls and for your emails. So please do write to us. And call in. And as I said, this show is meant to be to help us get more personally involved in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, so we can take more lessons, we can benefit more from it, and we can implement it in our lives. So, any questions, any comments, any suggestions, anything you would like to add, please do that during the live episode. And uh, until we meet, then I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to grant us uh, guidance to grant us forgiveness and to grant us sincerity in everything we do until we meet then assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah knows what's best for us so why should we complain we always want the sunshine but he knows there must be rain we always want the laughter and the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirit it's wrong and the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong.